So welcome, my name is Father E.K. Udo. I'm a Jesuit at Blessed Sacrament Parish in Hollywood. And during the month of July, we recorded a series called Getting to Know Him on the life of St. Ignatius of Loyola as a way to tell his story to those who maybe had not heard or those who are associated with the Jesuits or Ignatian spirituality who would love to get to know him better. Now, the reality is there are stories in the American history, sometimes in our family history, that have not been told, that have been overlooked, that have been ignored. And I am specifically referring to Black lives and Black contribution, both to the church and to the society. And so I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to actually hear the stories of Black Jesuits who contributed and worked and lived in our beautiful society of Jesus. And so, Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Father Joseph Brown. So, Father Joseph, welcome, welcome to the program. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate your project. You're welcome, you're welcome. So, we'll start right away with our first question. I wanted to just ask you a little bit about your family history. So, can you tell me about your family of origin, you know, your parents, maybe siblings. Let's go ahead. My family has been in the Midwest on my father's side of the family since the 1850s. We have a genealogy of my father's mother and father. His mother's family was in Southeast Missouri as early as 1850. Her mother had been an enslaved African woman and her father was an Irish immigrant who changed his nationality on the census to colored so that he could marry the mother of his children. And my grandmother was born in 1872 and she died in 1977. So she was 104 years old when she died. So I knew her because she helped to raise me. Mm. His, my father's father's family came to St. Louis in the, about 1850. And they have, we have some relatives, not a lot, uh, still in this great region, what they call the Metro St. Louis region between St. Louis over into Illinois. Uh, but my father's family were African Methodist Episcopal and my mother's family, she and her mother were Baptist. When they got married in 1932, maybe, they had a child, Frederick, Charles Frederick in 1933, and a daughter, Floyd Arlene in 1934, and both of my grandmothers told them that they had to find a church to raise their children in. Hmm. Neither one of them wanted to be either Baptist or AME, so they were really impressed with the social activism of some of the clergy, Catholic clergy in the East St. Louis and Southern Illinois region in the 1930s during the Depression. So they felt that the, these people were doing such a good thing for people in need when many of the government programs were not focused on Black people. So they wanted to convert to Catholicism. They were living in very Southern Illinois, about a half an hour away from the, the Kentucky border when they were taking instructions and the Catholic priest at that church in Mound City, Illinois, told them that he could not continue giving them instructions because if he did, his parishioners would run him out of town. Oh. That was the racism in the church that they experienced close and personal. They went back to East St. Louis and along with about eight or nine other families converted to Catholicism in East St. Louis working with the Society of African Missions uh -huh. priests. Yes. And uh, they became quite prominent in the, the mission church there. 
Mm -hmm. And my father and a number of the other men were devoted to developing spirituality and developing the community. In fact, in St. Louis, Missouri, mm -hmm. the Jesuits had a whites only retreat house mm -hmm. that black Catholics could not go to, even though black Catholics had been in St. Louis since the founding of the city. And of course, since the founding of the Jesuit mission there. Huh. So, a very rich Catholic in St. Louis decided that he would build a retreat house for black Catholics. And so as early as 1940, my father and a number of other black Catholic men from East St. Louis were making annual retreats there. Hmm. My father was not allowed to register and enroll in St. Louis University in the 40s because he wanted to get a college degree in social work, but it was restricted by race. Hmm. So when I was born in 1944 in East St. Louis, I had to be born in St. Louis, Missouri at the Colored Hospital because the Catholic hospital and the Catholic parishes were all segregated. Wow. Now, my mother and father fought that segregation from the very beginning, even as I said, as they were being instructed in the Catholic faith. So they raised me especially to understand what racism was in the early 1950s. So I had an older brother who was 11 years older than me, a sister 10 years older, they both are deceased, and a younger sister four years younger than me. And we went to Catholic grade school in East St. Louis. And then we moved in 1956 to Wisconsin where my sister and I desegregated an entire Catholic school system. I was 12, she was eight, and there was an awful lot of pressure. Mm. But I responded to that social pressure by becoming as my teachers told me, so this is not me bragging, mm. the smartest student in the school as being the only black student, because I had been raised so well in East St. Louis in an all black school that I was far ahead of my classmates. And they admitted that to me at our 50th anniversary high school reunion, that I helped at least seven of them get through high school wow. by tutoring them. Amen. Uh -huh. So after that, in my senior year in high school, there was a priest from the University of Notre Dame who came through because in the 1950s and early 60s, vocations was such a high priority in the Catholic Church that every Catholic school had some kind of vocation meetings. So he came by to talk to the senior boys about a vocation to the priesthood. So all of us had to meet him over a three-day period. Uh -huh. And when I met him, he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I wanted to be a teacher. And he said, well, the University of Notre Dame is run by my community of priests and we have some other colleges in this country that you might be able to be a priest and a teacher. And I said to him, because of the historical readings that I have been doing, the only group of priests that I would ever have any respect for would be the Jesuits because of the education they have done. I had never met a Jesuit, I had only read history books. Okay. And he said, oh, so then he went and told my high school principal that I was talking about a vocation to the Jesuits. Okay. Two weeks later, I was being interviewed for the Society of Jesus, and I had never said I wanted to be a Jesuit. I said, if I was going to be anything like mm -hmm. a priest and a teacher, I would be that group. Right. They just right. took it and ran with it. Mm. So my father, who, like I said, had been denied admissions to St. Louis University was very proud of me because I had gotten a scholarship to St. Louis University in 1962. Mm. And he was worried that if I went into the society and it didn't work out, would I lose that scholarship? Because for him, education was the most important thing that could happen. So the priest who was in charge of the interview morning went and called the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences in St. Louis. We were in Milwaukee and he called them and he came back and said that scholarship will be good for life. Oh. So there was no pressure on me to do one thing or another. And so the next thing you know, I was on a train going to the Jesuits in August of 1962. Wow, so I think- But I'm the child of converts uh -huh. who believed enough in the Catholic Church, but who were so working on racism. Yes that I knew both, that as my mother once said to some Jesuit scholastics, I don't come here to pray to that Monsignor because he's a racist. I come here to pray to Jesus. Amen, amen, wow. What, 
that is that is amazing. That is really really amazing. And actually, I think you've uh, touched on a little bit of another question about what drew you to choose the Society of Jesus, because you did mention part of it involved your your studies, right, and reading yes. history. Okay, I don't know if you want to say any more. Well, I that. I have always known since I was a sophomore in high school when we had a. a a questionnaire about what would you like to do, you know, when you grow up. Yeah. And I said, I would like to be a writer, a teacher, or a psychologist. Huh. And in the last 58 years, I've been able to do all three. <laughs> that is so... But the organizing effort comes out of the vocation. Mm. Since education has always been our charism, since the before they got the papal bull ratifying the society of Jesus, right. we've always been teaching. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what I have known since I was in grade school and high school that I wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. But to be of service and to develop a spirituality, I didn't find that to be a problem because I was doing that anyway in high school. Mm -hmm. So to combine them both, it didn't seem like it was that much of a, of a stretch of the imagination to do that. But teaching has always been what I've known. And so now in the year 2020, I can say that I started teaching on a college campus level 52 years ago. Wow, that is just amazing. Thank you so much for that service. Um, I was gonna I was gonna ask as well, like just telling us a little bit about um some of your values and kind of what 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 drives you? So just in the area of kind of uh, your passion, and maybe you've started to talk about that a bit, but... Um, what I is, really do believe, if you want to talk about a passion, yeah, it is, I think that I cannot ever divorce being Black, being Catholic, and being a man. Huh. All of those identities we all carry multiple identities. Yes. And therefore, everything about me has to be in play mm. at the same time. They mm. all have to be operative, every one of my parts of my identity. Mm. So what I want to do, I don't see any conflicts. However you would define me, whatever categories you would put me in, if they're the honest ones and true, then I don't feel I'm in conflict. Mm. So I will work to my, to my utmost to, to do two things, hmm. to always tell the truth and to educate the young. Hmm. Because as a black person, uh -huh. I do believe that education has always been our liberation. That was true on slave ships. Hmm. That was true on plantations. Hmm. That was true in the wilderness. That was true under trees. That was true in schools. Education has been the mechanism, as the great history book says by John Hope Franklin, from slavery to freedom. Mm -hmm. And that comes out of Frederick Douglass, from slavery to freedom. But all the different ways we are enslaved, you have to know things. You have to have your mind, your imagination, and anything that we can do to help our imagination and our intellect be mm -hmm. more involved and more and as full as possible that's how we are free. So mm -hmm. all the different levels of my identity, they're all to me the same one. Mm -hmm. So I want to teach the young mm -hmm. how to be free. Mm -hmm. And they're free in their minds first. Mm -hmm. And I have a rule in the family, in all my classes, in all the counseling and advising and mentoring I do. Mm -hmm. Don't lie to me and I won't lie to you. So now on a political and social level, both in the larger politics of the world and in the society of Jesus, I don't want to be lied to. Mm. And I don't like to live around people who are lying to themselves. Mm. Mm. So now some people would call that being prophetic. I only call it, I'm going to call you to be truthful because I'm calling myself to be truthful. Uh, amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, so, Father Joseph, I wanted to ask uh, what your mission is. So, what's your current mission in the Society of Jesus? 
1970, in the spring, oh. I called a group of my friends together uh -huh. to support one of our young Jesuit who was teaching at a high school in Wisconsin. It was a boarding school. And the two years before that, they had finally decided in 1968 to start desegregating the student population. Huh. I went to visit this friend of mine and he was being treated terribly by the other Jesuits huh. because he was trying to take up for and advocate for these young black teenage boys who were living in a world that they had no preparation for and the majority of the Jesuits in that community were not supported. Some were, but the majority weren't because they brought their racism with them. So I called a bunch of our friends together and we met in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in April of 1970 mm. so that we could support him in his work to help people who were at risk in our own institutions. And we had to help him in our own institution, the Society of Jesus. Mm. Well, in the last four years, mm -hmm. I have seen that group of that moment in 1970 come to fruition with a number of Jesuits who are now organizing themselves to be into involved in anti-racism initiatives. They are getting trained, educated, and they are working to combat, undo racism within the Society of Jesus, within the church, and within this country. And so my mission is to be the elder who says, I give you the sacrament of confirmation. Mm. That's me as a teacher and as a brother and as an elder. That's true in my biological family. That's true in my church family. That's true in my academic community. Mm. I am bestowing sacraments of initiation and confirmation and communion mm. and mission. Mm. Mm. Wow, amen. Amen. Um, and so this uh, question heading towards the end here, I was going to move towards this context that we're living in now. So, and you have started to address that a bit, but as we leave through this pandemic of the coronavirus and also seeking racial equity, um, what is your opinion on what we need to do to move things forward, both in the society of Jesus, in our families, and maybe in the wider society? I said it before that to me, telling the truth is a prophetic act. Mm. But I think that part of the prophetic act of telling the truth is to understand that we do that not to condemn, but to heal. Mm. We just celebrated and commemorated the death of John Lewis, one of the most important human beings who ever lived, yes. or the stature of a Desmond Tutu and a Malcolm X and a Martin Luther King and a Nelson Mandela and a John Lewis. There are no people who have ever demonstrated the love, the mercy, and the redemptive quality of striving for social justice, any more than John Lewis. Hmm. But also, this past, a few days ago, we commemorated what would be the 96th birthday of James Baldwin, hmm. whose voice is ringing louder in America than it has ever lived since, had has ever rung since he died in 1987. Wow. Baldwin is becoming the most important prophetic voice on how to make America what it's supposed to have been. Mm. The documentary movies, the videos, the YouTube uh, excerpts, the books, mm -hmm. the man's voice is ringing loud. Now, I was blessed to have spent time with him. Mm. Mm. I see that what we have to do mm. is to allow people to free themselves, not black people don't need to be free them, freeing themselves. They mm. need to be freeing the people who think they have to be oppressors. Mm. That is the whole movement of social justice. Mm. As I have said for years within the Society of Jesus, mm. if you understand the sacrament of reconciliation, mm -hmm. which is what we are about as human beings on this broken planet, mm. The first thing you have to do is say, 
Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Mm. That's what the Truth and Reconciliation Movement in South Africa was. Mm. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And mm. then you wait in humble openness, hoping, hoping mm. that you will be heard and forgiven. And mm. that's where the healing starts. It's backwards. Why should anybody in the year 2020 have to be protesting for human rights, yeah. protesting for civil rights, mm. protesting for their citizenship? Mm. That's not something you should be fighting for. And mm. nobody should tell me how I'm supposed to be quiet as I fight for something that should have been mine the day I was born. Mm. So the people who withhold it mm. are the people who must be healed of their own tortured lives. Hmm. And that's what John Lewis did, what Martin Luther King did, what Fannie Lou Hamer did, hmm. what Emmett Till's mother did when she showed his casket. Yeah. Calling people to say, I have sinned, hmm. forgive me. Hmm. If we could do that in this country, we would be on the quickest way to healing and the beloved community. But we've got it backwards. Black people keep saying, stop hurting us. Mm. The people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm and James Baldwin and W.B. Du Bois were saying, you have to stop hurting yourself, people. Uh, and if that's not the, if that should be the message mm. and the motive of the Roman Catholic Church for healing. Mm. Amen. Amen. Wow, Father Joseph. Um, I greatly appreciate uh, your taking the time to have this conversation with us and just to help us to know your story and really tell us how with truth, with reconciliation, we can continue to move forward together. Greatly appreciate you for confirming us as well and inspiring us to go ahead on this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep doing this because it's very important. So I appreciate being invited. Thank you. So that's it for us. Uh, until next time, we'll have another episode of Getting to Know Him to hear more of our stories and to grow together as the beloved community.